Okay, so good morning everybody. My name is Corinne Verchi chaptal I'm professor of management studies and uh, a part of my research uh, focuses on human resource management policies in large corporations and how, how these policies evolved over, uh, over the years. Uh, so today I'm going to present you a synthesis of these studies. Uh, this presentation uh, will draw on the paper uh, which has been circulated uh, among you uh, and uh, that is uh, published uh, with uh, two French colleagues in the Journal of uh, uh, Industrial Relations. Uh, so uh, I would start, uh, I would like to start off uh, with an outline of my research approach and teaching approach also. Uh, I try to develop a systemic approach to management, uh, focusing on the interaction uh, between, between three dimensions, uh, namely governance uh, pattern of the firm, uh, this comp its competitive strategy and its uh, HRN policies, which also uh, include an analysis of organizational firms. Uh, I consider uh, these dimensions as closely interrelated and depending on the choices uh, corporations make on three markets. Uh, namely uh, the labor and financial market uh, or capital market and product market also. So uh, we can consider this approach as configurational insofar as it considers the choices corporations make on these different markets as closely interrelated. Um, the nexus formed by these uh, three dimensions has to be framed within the context of today's globalization, which is characterized by, uh, first, uh, the rise of institutional investors on capital markets and the globalization of labor and product markets. At the management level, this has brought about the financialization and globalization of strategy with a focus on core businesses and global brands development and the spread of transnational production networks um, that uh, uh, has been studied uh, in the global value chain approach. You see this uh, gl say global value chain approach, I believe. Uh, and a market-based uh, HRM model applied to employees uh, under these new strategic orientations. During this, during this presentation, I will explain some of the changes that are effective affecting each management uh, dimension. While doing so, I will particularly focus on the transformation of HRM policies in relation to uh, changes in governance pattern as well as in competitive strategy. I will also try to frame these uh, evolutions within the French socio-institutional context and uh, I will conclude by highlighting the consequences of these strategic shifts in terms of greater insecurity and inequality of treatment among employees. And um, uh, we, will discuss, we will discuss this, but uh, um, uh, the results uh, are signaling reduced uh, capacity of, Fren of French capitalism to offer employment protection and stability uh, to co-workers in large, large corporations. Uh, so, uh, as for the outline, uh, in the first part of the presentation, uh, we will discuss uh, the rise of global 
financialize cooperation and try to explain uh, and to uh, uh, yes to explain the um, characteristics of this uh, model. And in the second part of the presentation, uh, we uh, we try to explain. Uh, how do global, global, global <laughs> globalization and financialization of strategies impact uh, the HRM policies in large corporations? So, concerning the rise of global financialized cooperation, uh, uh, we can consider that uh, during the 80s and 90s, uh, developed countries have, have known a major shift uh, towards a new form of patrimonial or shareholder capitalism. This capitalism is defined uh, by the rights of institutional investors as prominent shareholders of large corporations. This transformation has been initiated in the US during the 18s. Uh, over the following decades, this financialization has spread to European countries uh, such as France. As we will see, and it is an, imp an important point in terms of management issue, these changes in large corporation uh, governance model or governance pattern are closely linked uh, with the shift towards a global pattern of competition. Uh, so what does a corporate financialization mean? Uh, we, can we can consider that this concept refers to the prioritization uh, of financial returns in the objectives of the firm. So objective to increase shareholders' returns has become predominant in the strategic management of large corporations. According to the shareholder value ideology, shareholders are the legitimate recipient of the value created by the firm. Such belief directly impacts the way corporations choose to allocate their cash flow. And um, we can see that major U.S. corporations then shift from a retain and reinvest strategy uh, to a strategy of downsize, downsize and distribute. Uh, in, the first in the first case, cash flows are used to sustain the growth of corporation. With the second strategy, work externalization and dismissals are combined uh, to enable greater cash flow distribution to shareholders in the form of dividend uh, and uh, share buybacks. So what are the key factors in the diffusion of this shareholder ideology? Uh, the race on financial results is combined with the adoption of new performance measure. They set expected returns on investment at high level of about 15%. In major markets, such levels can only be obtained uh, via restructuring, drastic cost reductions and social dumping measures. We can also mention newly adopted uh, performance indicators such as EVA, economic value added. Within, within this context, uh, greater investor pressures have been passed on to top management. Uh, so this implicitly promotes a transfer of risk from shareholders to corporations and in turn from firms to employees and suppliers. This process of financialization operates through a diversity of devices. Uh, we can mention more and more important reporting processes with tools organizing them at different layers from business unit 
to corporate headquarters, and then in turn from consolidating entities to financial markets. Also, we can mention more and more interactions uh, between the firm's top management uh, and financial market through world shows, conference calls, or one-to-one sessions uh, where uh, top management meets with potential investors. We can also highlight an alignment of shareholders and manager, manager interest uh, using performance appraisal system based on EVA type indicators for executive and managers articulated, uh, articulated with a st stock option distribution uh, which reached an uh, exceptionally high level in France. Uh, we can also mention uh, a strong internationalization of managing, managing teams to, facili to facilitate the spread of shareholder ideology. Um, while shareholder uh, capitalism spread from US overseas uh, during the 90s, uh, the importance of these changes generates some disagreement uh, reflected in the diversity of capitalism studies. According to observations, uh, forces were not converging uh, and toward uh, shareholder capitalism across country and there are national specificities uh, which are persistent. Uh, by the way, in the French context, the strategic shift toward financialization was initiated by corporation rather deliberately. Uh, indeed, at that time, corporations engage in global strategies on product markets. Their primary aim uh, was to build a leadership position at a transnational rather than domestic level, generating a more and more important merger and acquisition. Uh, so corporate effort to meet the demand of financial market were made to boost uh, stock prices in order to finance international acquisition. Uh, so in the race to a global leadership, a top management engage more and more with financial markets. Inter financial market identify global strategies as key lever uh, to uh, value creation. So in that sense, uh, we can consider that the pursuit of global leadership and financialization are but a few angles of the same uh, uh, phenomenon. And we can note that uh, the term uh, financialization uh, reflects itself uh, very well this idea uh, that finance and strategy are very closely linked together. So the French form of uh, financialization is linked to a global pattern of competition promoted uh, by top managers. Uh, this model is based on global specialization in core businesses uh, to, to produce so-called pure player. Uh, investment in branding, marketing and energy and research and development, and disinvestment and or systematic cost reduction in manufacturing and basic services processing. Uh, this model or these principles uh, was promoted as holding superior capacity for scale economies and shareholder value uh, delivery. Uh, therefore, uh, investors and top managers' rationales became mutually reinforced. Uh, 
in this French context. Now, um, in, this, in the second part of this presentation, uh, we will see how do financialization and globalization affect corporate strategy in terms of HRA. In the late 90s, a leading American thinkers working on US uh, employment highlighted the increasing pressures uh, exerted by investors on large firms uh, in terms of cutting costs and <coughs> improving profits. Uh, these policies uh, were set not only to downsize on the basis of dismissals and subcontracting, but also to extend to labor the just-in-time procurement practices uh, that could be seen for other production factors, particularly through continuous hire and fire on the labor market. Some observers announced the demise of American internal labor market. Among them, Peter Capelli said that career jobs dead and that companies were managing without commitment, market-based employment relationship built on depersonalized bilateral short-term exchanges. In large US corporations, work communities were dissolved and with the market becoming the dominant coordinating mechanism. The shift towards a market-based HRA model has been well established in the US or the UK. However, the effects that the financialization had on employment uh, relation uh, in Europe, uh, in Europe country remain more controversial. Uh, according to research in France, a greater financialization doesn't come at the expense of workers insofar as a strong legal system <coughs> continues to offer employment protection. Indeed, within the French institutional context, employers must provide a legal uh, reason, either economic or personal, for dismissing workers. Economic dismissal relate to a firm's employment policies, including uh, downsizing. Personal dismissals pertain to an employee's faulty behavior or insufficient performance. Uh, when economic dismissals reach a threshold of uh, 10 within a 30 period, they fall under a collective procedure uh, this procedure requires the employer to inform both the local union and the labor department about uh, their dismissal plans. Uh, the objective of this plan of this plan is to give priority to displaced workers in subsequent uh, rehiring and to demonstrate uh, that uh, no job alternatives uh, could be offered to employees uh, elsewhere in the company, uh, namely worldwide in the case of multinational. Um, what we can see that uh, it's that surprisingly, uh, although downsizing plans often is the headline of the uh, in the business press, over the 1995 and 2005 period, economic dismissal fell by 38%, whereas personal dismissal grew by 70%. Uh, it's very important to mention that personal dismiss dismissal is still requiring a legal reason fall outside the traditional scope of local union, of labor union intervention. Therefore, personal dismissal increase 
places a growing number of employees in situations where they have to confront their employers while being sometimes very isolated. Uh, if they want to contest uh, dismissal conditions, they can only do so by without into court via the so-called Conseil des Prud'hommes, uh, composed uh, to elected representatives of employee and employers. Uh, with such changes affective, affecting the firm dismissal practice, uh, we can consider that the French institutional context has become less protective of employees than it was when economic dismissal predominated in the country. Uh, so we conduct uh, a survey uh, using a sample of six multinationals. Uh, this survey focusing, focusing on the way in which these personal dismissals are used and embedded uh, in broader uh, new HR model. Uh, we conducted interviews uh, with HR manager or director and skilled employees, uh, including both manager and professionals, uh, who were working or had been working recently uh, for one of the six multinational studied. Uh, our results focused on cross-case similarities was uh, rather than differences and uh, as well uh, focused on the overall patterns that unfold <coughs> at various time and to different degrees within the firms studied. Uh, on the basis of this survey, we argue that such a management market-based HR model has gained a growing influence across large corporations in France. We are now trying to characterize uh, this uh, market-based uh, model. Uh, we will first take uh, the opening of internal mar labor markets. Um, the shift towards uh, financialization and uh, globalization uh, acted as the start of the opening of internal labor markets. Uh, indeed, globalization and financialization of strategy makes necessary for firms a new managerial skill that corporations can obtain through external hiring rather than through internal promotions. So HRM is now evolving uh, toward an up or out system where managers have to leave after a few, year, few years if they don't climb up uh, the hierarchical ladder. Rather than uh, internal, internal promotion, financial compensation based on individualized performance system plays a central role in the market-based relationship that companies aim to develop. Uh, this system can be seen as combining the carrot and the, and the stick. Uh, as it appears, a performance appraisal system are used not only to reward, but also to sanction. Uh, we identify uh, significant differences in the way skilled employees of various ages experience uh, this shift towards a more contractual employment relationship. Uh, we use an empirically uh, distinction between seniors defined as age 40 or more and juniors defined as uh, being younger uh, than uh, 40. Seniors uh, demonstrate a strong attachment to internal careers. Uh, 
uh, based on employment stability and competency development policies. They also demonstrate a strong attachment to values uh, inherited from the Fordist compromise. Uh, by contrast, uh, the junior uh, um, have difficulties adhering to corporate cultures which they perceive as highly normative. Uh, they are distancing themselves uh, from the firm, the firm is in such a way that the trust component experienced by seniors is almost, is almost non-existent uh, for juniors. Of course, going through a dismissal uh, plays a role in the formation of such distanced uh, attitude. Consequently, uh, juniors uh, attempt to, to strike a better balance between the professional and personal uh, lives. Although the presence uh, of markets uh, becomes a strong feature of employment patterns in the firms, we, um, we the importance translated in very different ways depending on employee level of responsibility. Uh, indeed, HRM becomes uh, more um, increasingly segmented, uh, drawing lines uh, between global and local levels, as well as between a very small elite of high potentials uh, whose career are actively managed and the rest. Uh, this segmentation is implemented in various ways uh, within the firm studied, uh, from a deliberately a dual system to a softer mix uh, of high potential and traditional career systems. Um, this translates into distinct work experiences and career opportunities uh, for global versus local employees. Uh, as for global employees, um, they play a key role in running globalization and uh, financialization strategies. Uh, this small elite is training uh, in order to implement global financialized uh, strategies on the basis of accelerated uh, job rotation across country and business unit within the firms. Uh, high potential typically uh, stay uh, for an average of two, three years in a given position in the, within the firm. Uh, they benefit from dedicated compensation system, including stock option and uh, accelerated uh, compensation increases. They are selective with employers and they use the bargaining power uh, they have with employers. At the same time, uh, global managers are expected to maintain high uh, and failing work performance. And if one of them fails uh, to, uh, to meet work objectives in a given project, uh, one can lose a high potential label uh, without uh, notice or be asked to leave the company. As for local uh, skilled employees, um, they feel uh, downgraded to a subordinated role. Uh, at the local level, uh, skilled employees are expected to take the responsibility of managing their own career uh, under market-oriented conditions. Uh, intranet job fairs have been set up at a number of firms in order to match internal job uh, demand and supply. Uh, their speeches converge uh, to portray uh, changes uh, towards new forms of control and decision making that they perceive as more remote, depersonalized and less uh, predictable than in the past. Consequently, people find it more difficult 
to understand the logic and orientation of their own work. According to local employees, corporations do not give do not give everyone the same chan chances and attention. Uh, we could uh, also observe across our sample an accelerated mobility as well as the use of individual performance appraisal systems uh, to produce uh, situations where dismissal for personal reasons become uh, a routine part of manager and HR uh, staff activity. Significant difference can be noted between global and local employees regarding uh, the ways in which they deal with personal dismissal. Global employees uh, legitimate this dismissal considering it as a management tool. Global managers are themselves uh, exposed to this dismissal, to this type of dismissal, and they are able to negotiate a financial package when leaving the company. Uh, in the cases we look, uh, we could look at negotiations uh, were in general straightforward. Uh, this form of dismissal is perceived as a contractual uh, arrangement. By contrast, uh, personal dismissals produce a feeling of exclusion uh, for local uh, employees. For some local managers, uh, such dismissals follow an eviction process, uh, meaning a demoralization campaign aimed at pushing uh, them out of their job. Uh, local employees also feel that the legal reason for their dismissal was imposed on them. Uh, transactions offered uh, to local employees are typically equiva equivalent uh, to the legal uh, indemnities uh, that the employer would have to pay under the French law. Uh, so most employees refuse such transactions and choose to sue their employer contesting the legal reason uh, for the dismissal and seeking higher financial compensations. Uh, however, uh, the choice to go to court is not exclu exclusively based on financial consideration. It's, it also uh, conveys a symbolic uh, demand uh, for some form of justice. Uh, so, uh, while our case studies are by definition limited in scope, they allow us to identify the film specific ways in which uh, the influence of financialization and globalization unfold in the management of scale employees and how uh, it contributes uh, to reduce uh, employment protection and stability for core workers uh, within the firms uh, studied. Uh, dismissal for personal reason have become a management tool allowing firms uh, to individualize employment termination. It enables them to introduce some flexibility in their relationship uh, to core workers who benefit uh, from standard form, forms of employment previously associated uh, with stability. Uh, of course, the importance of the phenomenon varies depending on the firm's uh, studies. While some firms attracted uh, the attention of the business uh, press by systemizing personal dismissal on a large scale, uh, others made softer uh, use of this uh, dismissal. Um, uh, just, just a point. Uh, in 2008, a law on the modernization of the labor contract 
made it possible for employers and employees uh, to end employment relationship on the basis of a common agreement. Uh, that is without resorting to dismissal procedures. Uh, such legis legislative uh, changes underlie a conception of employment relation as bilateral, reversible uh, contracts rather than collective dynamic. We could discuss of uh, this evolution during your reaction on during uh, the debate. So thank you. <laughs> Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Mrs. Verchet for her insightful presentation. Uh, we are going to try to keep up with the same level. Um, so I'm going to proceed to the table of contents. Uh, first, we're going to t I'm going to talk about the article and then Javier is going to cover uh, what is happening in the United States in terms of financialization and human resources management. And then we are going to ask some questions, then we're going to show the bibliography. Uh, so the article's research question is, how globalization and financialization impact on corporate strategies and ultimately on human resources management in France? Uh, yes. Oh, so yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's true. Or maybe here, yeah. Uh, so, uh, the empirical work is done through a collection of interviews um, of employees in France. Um, so, uh, with the advent of globalization, competition increases cons considerably. So, uh, companies, um, they try to build and maintain leadership positions uh, at a transnational level, which can lead to uh, cost-cutting uh, strategies and uh, strategies that aim at mergers and acquisitions. Uh, but um, when financialization come into the picture, um, basically um, shareholder value, the shareholder value maximization mentality is put forward um, as a way of attracting shareholders with the purpose of guaranteeing a source of funding. Uh, so we have a lot of instruments to do this. Uh, no, nowadays, uh, companies are a higher proportion of the profits is given to shareholders in the form of dividends. Uh, additionally, uh, the uh, company's profits uh, are being used to buy share, buy, uh, are, are being used to buy back shares uh, as a way of increasing the share prices. Um, and it also, um, it actually contributes um, uh, actually the, the redistribution of profits uh, in, in to shareholders uh, can get increased because their shareholders they, they can buy they can realize capital gains by selling the shares so uh, <coughs> the the redistribution to profits to shareholders can get increased this way uh, additionally stock op options are granted to uh, top executives to uh, as a way of motivating them to perform better um, and also we have the use of uh, economic value added indicators to monitor performance and reward executives uh, but how this changes towards financialization and globalization have an impact on human resources management um, <coughs> in order to increase shareholders dividends and in order to um, realize uh, share buybacks, the companies need to increase their profits and what is the easy way to do it? It's by cutting costs and sometimes it leads to job losses and uh, so there has been a shift from retain and reinvest strategy to a downsize and distribute strategy. Uh, additionally, uh, the performance of prisons uh, the performance appraisal systems such as performance-based uh, bonuses and stock option policies, uh, they have been put into place to improve workers' performances, but it can also produce situations where dismissals for a personal reason become a routine. Um, maybe I should make a distinction, a distinction between economic um, 
dismissal and personal dismissal. Economic dismissal happens when you, uh, the company is no longer profitable, so it's uh, <coughs> they are allowed to um, dismiss people. Uh, um, when they have a personal personal dismissals happen when the the, the employee is no longer uh, efficient, uh, her, his performance is bad. Um, so uh, we actually in France we noticed that uh, a, a greater employee turnover for personal dismissals. Uh, as we can see, the numbers uh, show that. Uh, and now, <coughs> so now we're gonna turn to the U.S. case. Uh, we don't actually address really the human resource management component. We take more of a broader perspective on in here. Uh, so just to start. Um, since the 2000s, globalization has been characterized by the downsides of the labor force and the movement of um, jobs offshore to lower wage areas around the world, like China and India, um, where there is actually a large pool of highly capable and uh, well lower wage labor, you know, that has actually taken over those uh, economic activities that used to be routine in the U.S. for so many years. And part of the driver for this, too, was the revolution in information and communication technology systems, which made the widespread use of these um, systems uh, cheaper you know, around the world. And um, some of the reasons behind the downsize, downsizing phenomenon of the labor force include the globalization of product markets, the intensified competition with um, other global players, and also the decline in power of uh, labor unions. And, um, actually mitigating the job losses that have been going on through in the U.S. and uh, actually influencing as well corporate strategies that uh, involved in downsizing of the labor force and offshoring. And just, uh, just to have an idea of the, um, how the power of unions have gone down throughout the years from in 1983, uh, private sector union unionization rate was at 16.8 percent while in 2013 was greatly reduced up to 6.7 percent, and um, so, so a lot of um, uh, workers along the organizational structure of the company have actually um, been negatively affected by these uh, corporate restructurings. Um, first of all, since the 80s, you know, we see the U.S. has lost a lot of uh, blue-collar jobs, those that are related to manufacturing or capital goods um, industries. Uh, which were uh, very uh, relatively well paid and included mainly um, high school educated workers. Um, then in the 90s, we also see that non unionized white collar jobs have been lost greatly. These include technical, professional, um, administrative positions that are related more towards like the management of a company. So um, these relate to the French case that also high skill employees are also. Um, been uh, negatively affected by these globalization trends. And uh, lastly, during the 2000s with the globalization of high-tech jobs, also highly educated and highly experienced workers have become more vulnerable and to um, loss in, in employment. And as, ah, oh, I'm missing a slide here. Well, I had another slide there that talked about um, financialization mm -hmm. as well, which is the other side of the coin of globalization, which is this um, fixation over uh, the downsize and distribute regime, which seeks to maximize shareholder value, um, and which also, well, there's been a lot of concerns, a lot of criticisms around it in terms of it puts at risk the long-term um, investment of companies, the long-term growth, it stifles innovation, um, it also harms long-term competitiveness of the firm. And um, one of the main drivers that, uh, one of the main um, how do you say, mechanisms that um, corporations have employed wa is through these large-scale buyback programs. And, um, oh wow. So I'm missing two slides, uh, uh, which um, basically they have the effect, right, of, of reducing the supplies uh, of stocks in the, in the stock market, which enhance increases uh, stock prices. And um, it just 
just some uh, statistics here, uh, just to grasp the magnitude of how massive in scale this has gone and been systemic as well because major corporations have engaged in this practice. Um, so uh, a, a nice investigative report by Reuters recently last year found out that 60% of 3,300 publicly traded non-financial companies have bought back their shares since 2010. And just last year, in the fiscal year 2014, um, there's been a record uh, uh, established in, in, in stock buybacks of equaling to $520 billion plus uh, $365 billion in, in, in distribution of dividends among shareholders, which totals to uh, $885 billion return, well, return to shareholders, uh, much greater than the combined net income of all these companies. Um, also, another point here is that uh, a lot of these companies, because it's just very cheap to borrow nowadays because of long interest rate environment, uh, these companies have also engaged in, in a lot of debt in order to finance these <laughs> buyback programs. And um, also, uh, even if they're operating at a loss, it doesn't prevent them also to engage in, in, in buying up their stocks. Um, and since 2009, after the crisis, you know, uh, non-financial companies have spent about $2.24 trillion in, in, in buying back their shares. Um, so just to give you ideas of some of the companies having, that have engaged in these practices, we see that um, ExxonMobil uh, has been the one that has the largest uh, purchaser of the stock at $217 billion equaling about 84% plus dividends over their um, net income. And Hewlett Parkard actually, again, um, they just have gone over the limits and, uh, and equal their stock buybacks plus their distribu distribution of dividends have equaled 168% of their corporate net income. So it j this just shows how like the major, the biggest companies actually in the US have also uh, systematically been involved in this in this um, practice, mm -hmm. and also related to this is um, CEO compensation. You know, um, most of these U.S. corporations uh, tie CEO pay to to e to earnings per share and other metrics um, that come from the stock price, such as stock price appreciation, and this produces a a, a strong incentive, a actually pervasive incentive. Um, for top executives to engage um, in certain steps to increase the, the prices of their stocks. Um, and of course, th these buybacks, you know, provide an easy way for them to do that. And which also at the same time helps them meet these performance targets, um, such as earnings per share, which in turn unlock other uh, payment benefits and bonuses and the like for them. So there's been criticism um, that over the use of these short-term performance target, um, which executives are using these stock repurchases to enrich themselves at the expense of um, investing in the long-term health of the company, um, also in spending in capital investment and actually generating employment opportunities. Um, and also that uh, this phenomenon has contributed to the winding in income inequality as uh, top executive pay has just ever risen um, while concentrated income at the top end of the income uh, distribution. And it has been widely documented also that as these top executives um, also make up uh, a large part of the, for example, in the U.S., the top 0.1 percent, you know, in the, in the income distribution. Um, and then again, just to give you an idea how bad this problem has become, uh, this shows the CEO annual average comp uh, compensation throughout the years. Uh, this is taken from a sample of 300, the largest 350 um, companies, publicly traded companies in the U.S. Um, so we see that from 1995, for example, uh, five million, uh, around six million dollars was the average um, compensation for the CEO. This has tripled to all the way to 2014. Well, we see in the second column, uh, the private sector production non supervisory workers, which is a proxy for like the typical worker, we can say um, salary for them has basically stagnated, um, especially you know, in the years after the crisis. And just to see the ratio in the last column, um, it has it's gotten to a point that CEOs actually make more than 300 times 
of what the average worker uh, makes, uh, which the peak was in actually in the year 2000, as we can see, is in 376. But um, definitely where we're at right now, uh, it's way more than what was actually, you know, how the levels were at in, during the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, so yeah, just to wrap up, uh, I'm quoting here Lasonic, which is one of the main scholars, you know, this financialization phenomenon in the U.S. And basically he's saying that this uh, concentration of income at the top end of the distribution, mainly through stock buybacks and executive pay, have been uh, a, a cause and effect of the disappearance of middle class jobs in the U.S. over the past three decades. It is the cause. Um, because of the, incent the incentives the stock based pay gives to tor top corporate executives to downside and, and distribute rather than retain and, and invest in the company as it was done in the prior years, you know, during the, especially during after World War II, for example, the 20, 30 years afterwards. And it's also in the fact of the disappearance of these middle class jobs um, because of the trillions of dollars that uh, um, the buybacks, for example, free up and that ends up in the pockets of, for example, of, of, of top executives. And this, at the end, just places um, the US economy into, into in a vulnerable position in terms of becoming more prosperous in the, f in the future to come as uh, the middle class um, actually sustains you know, the long-term growth of the economy. So it's actually um, very, uh, well, he questions you know, how, how further can this process go and um, and w and if it, if nothing changes, it will just create you know further instability in the economy, further inequality. Um, so yeah, and um, we'll pass it on to Maria. Thank you. Okay, let's proceed to the questions now. Um, but just let's first contextualize the question. Uh, so I I read an article by Shang, and. Um, he actually uh, proposes a lot of measures to prevent financialization from having a negative impact on workers. Uh, for example, in some countries there are formal representation by workers in company management. For example, the presence of union rep representatives on company supervisory boards in Germany. Uh, that, that actually makes a lot of sense because when it comes to company ma management workers uh, that tend to have a higher uh, long-term orientation than floating shareholders uh, actually the presence of floating shareholders uh, <coughs> feeds the shareholder value maximization mentality i think and uh, that's why in many countries, the government has held sizable share ownership in key enterprises or indirectly through ownership by state-owned banks uh, enacted as a stable shareholder. Uh, is the use of these instruments a valid means to counteract financialization and its impact on workers? Um. <coughs> Also, given the pressures of globalization, is guaranteeing employment security and maintaining competitiveness mutually exclusive? Um, what regulatory actions can be taken so to prevent the leadership of a company from focusing on boosting uh, stock prices and instead emphasize innovation and productive investment? Uh, and last, what other indicators can be used to measure performance of top executives that don't rely on short-term variables and are of often prone to manipulation, manipulation, such as earnings per share. That's it. <laughs> That's our presentation. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation and your input. Uh, on this, um, uh, for this subject. Uh, yes, maybe the first point uh, concerning uh, the participation of uh, employees uh, or uh, employees uh, representation of employees uh, in the governance of uh, the firm. Uh, 
so um, uh, now uh, there is in in France uh, a research. I don't know if you know um, Olivier Favreau. No. Uh, uh, so there is a research uh, about how a more collaborative uh, governance pattern we uh, that uh, include a uh, representation of employer uh, can uh, regulate uh, this uh, evolution and can regulate the effects and impact uh, of uh, financialization trade. Um, uh, my I don't know, uh, I don't study uh, uh, this, uh, this more collaborative uh, governance uh, pattern, uh, but um, for me uh, uh, the point is uh, that uh, all uh, measure uh, as uh, uh, include uh, employee representation as a corporate social responsibility. I don't know if you have a seminar around this uh, issue of corporate social responsibility. All these um, evolutions um, are really limited uh, because uh, competitive strategies are really, really uh, strong. Uh, so uh, no, I think nothing is really um, possible in long term uh, if uh, we don't try uh, a way to reduce <laughs> the competition. Uh, it's my point of view. Uh, we speak about uh, uh, innovation uh, to gain the competition. Do you know the Blue Ocean, the strategy of Blue Ocean? No. Uh, in fact, <laughs> <laughs> in fact, it's a strategy. It's a model. It's a strategic model uh, that comes uh, from Harvard, and um, the thesis is that. Uh, now the competition is too strong and uh, we are on red, uh, red uh, ocean, blues, and uh, we have to innovate uh, to go to blue ocean. Uh, my point of view is as you ha you we have uh, to reduce the pressure on red ocean. I don't know how a uh, solution, it's my point of view, I don't know how a solution as the one you, you, you speak about, uh, about representation of employee, how a solution can work uh, in the context of transnational, strong pressure, competitive pressure. It's very difficult. I studied and um, I would like to speak about uh, this study uh, in in this uh, uh, for you, but it was difficult to to progr to plan uh, this uh, intervention. I studied um, how to um, to make more responsible uh, the governance of global value chain. Okay, you know the global value sh value chain and the transfer of risk and flexibility from the lead firms uh, to the supplier and from the supplier to the employees uh, in the country uh, as uh, Bangladesh. As uh, uh, so, it's impossible to try uh, to uh, make this <laughs> global value chain more responsible uh, if you uh, if the competitive pressure are so strong. It's my point of view. Uh, uh, little radical <laughs> point of view, but um, all the studies I made uh, before, uh, I studied the corporate social responsibility, but uh, I, it's uh, difficult to work if, uh, uh, so it's my point of view. Um, <laughs> so what other indicator? I, I uh, the last one, uh, and after the first one, <laughs> what other indicators can be used to measure performance of top, e top executives that don't rely on short-term variable? Uh, uh, if, the, if the objectives is the 
increase of shareholder value, <laughs> it's difficult to find another indicator than the urea, economic value added. Uh, so, uh, uh, the point is that you can, may, you can introduce um, other indicators as a, a learning plane, as an educational plane, as um, uh, stability uh, reduces the, turno the turnover, but uh, these um, indicators don't uh, measure uh, the return on investment. Uh, so uh, we can imagine a lot of uh, other indicators, but if, the, if you prioritize uh, the return of its investment and uh, the increase of uh, uh, shareholder profits, it's difficult to uh, use other indicators. Uh, firms try to combine uh, in the large corporation, we can see that um, uh, the governance system and the management system uh, try to combine uh, the, uh, two types of indicator. We are in tension, in fact, uh, as uh, the reduce of uh, salaries uh, and uh, the uh, increase of commitment of employees. Uh, so, uh, in fact, when we, um, when we study uh, the, the evolution of management system, uh, we see that the firm try to articulate a short-term management logic with long-term investment management logic. But uh, these are very, uh, with a lot of tension, in fact. Uh, so, but they try to combine uh, and to use uh, some, um, it's difficult for me. Um, given the pressures of globalization, uh, is guaranteeing employing security and maintaining competitiveness mutually uh, exclusive. Uh, I can, uh, I, <laughs> I try to uh, give a read. Uh, uh, it's very difficult, uh, um, given the pressures of globalization, uh, uh, it's very difficult uh, to uh, guarantee employment security, but you can try to imagine different forms of employing security. And is um, uh, uh, my point of view is that you uh, you have to start research and we start research uh, to find uh, all the models to guarantee uh, employment security and uh, uh, we can possible uh, more flexibility also but without create too much inequality uh, so we have for now we don't have another model than the uh, precedent uh, model of employment of course, some, of course, we have to, to make some changes, uh, but um, how to uh, maintain competitiveness and how to uh, avoid uh, the increase of inequality, it depends on the level of, competitive, um, of competitiveness we want. Uh, for, for me. Uh, uh, what regulatory actions can be taken so to prevent the leadership of a company from focusing <laughs> on boosting stock price and instead in fines, innovation and productive investment? If I know that, <laughs> wow, <laughs> no, it's difficult. It's um, it's a question of macro regulation, and in the question of. Um, of way to see the growth and of way to see uh, the necessity of regulation or no and um, uh, my uh, my position is on the micro uh, uh, 
uh, micro level and micro regulation, of course, uh, all my research is to try to link micro regulation with the frame of uh, uh, macro regulation, but I'm not a regulationist and uh, I, I read uh, the work of regulationists and I hope uh, they will find uh, some solution to um, prevent the leadership. Oh, so sorry for that. But <laughs> Thank you to you. <laughs> ah, uh, lady first. <laughs> Just. <laughs> Thank you. When you say you're not a regulationist, but you actually dealt with corporate social responsibility so far in the micro level. When you say that you are not a regulationist, but you said so far that you have worked on the corporate social responsibility uh, issues at the micro level. Um, what do you mean by that? In the sense that how can you deal without not dealing at a regulationist level? Do you deal at the NGO level, which is your interest group, uh, and what progress did you make so far in that uh, in that area? Because my opinion, what I've seen so far in corporate social responsibility is there's actually a marketing strategy by big companies to to to, to get people to be more self-aware about the brand than an actual improvement of whatever responsibility means to these firms. So. What's your take on that? Uh, um, yes, um, my research about um, corporate social resp responsibility were in the um, uh, industry of apparel and um, I uh, studied um, the code of conduct. A uh, lead firm as Nike or uh, lead fair uh, product to uh, respond to to make more responsive their uh, suppliers and uh, of course um, uh, there are a lot of contradiction in uh, this uh, policy of corporate responsibility because in fact they uh, they try to uh, they want that their suppliers um, apply the code of conduct uh, but in the same time they don't modify uh, the pressure of uh, they put on their supplier in terms of price, in terms of flexibility, uh, in terms uh, of uh, yes, time and flexibility. So, of course, uh, the pressure uh, concerning time, flexibility, just the just-in-time production and the flexibility of production and the price always, always, always has to be reduced, uh, uh, impact, impact the HRM policies within the supplier factory, of course. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, um, uh, it's just, in fact, when a uh, when lead firm uh, says that, look, I am responsible because I have a code of conduct, a very elaborated code of conduct, in fact, uh, it just uh, make pressure and uh, tension on supplier, but they don't change the condition, the labor condition. Uh yeah, but you're talking about that only in the spectrum of global value chains and the fact that Nike produces and uses uh, a, a company or whatever, um, a plant in Bangladesh and kids just do like the shoes and so on. But where's the line that? You say code of conduct, but shouldn't there be a regulationist approach about child labor, about the fact that these companies cannot just outsource and uh, pretend to not be to not be responsible for the outsourcing that they do and because what i find interesting there is that you say that you worked on that at a micro level but you're not a regulationist so what's the line there are you just working on a kind of conduct that it's ethical somehow ethical by which standards then but somehow ethical to our european values or whatever but then w what is the actual change when does this stop because I think that corporate social responsibility is just a way of big business to uh, have a brand image, like have a, uh, improve their brand image. But as far as um, 
well, you mentioned global value chain, but I can mention pollution uh, as one of the, the issues that it's in their code of contacts, but they do nothing about it unless they are forced to by regulations. So when, how do we do that? How do we interfere in that, basically? Not at the micro level, but at the ma macro level somehow. That was my question. Because I think that right now at the micro level, nothing is being done. So how to articulate a micro and micro level? In the context of putting these big businesses to in, in front of the actual abuse that they're doing, both in terms of environment or child labor or labor or factories. I mean, you mentioned Nike, but even Apple with Foxtron and everything. Like. Mm -hmm. um. No, uh, yeah, um, I think uh, that uh, there are interesting initiatives in terms of, uh, do you know MSI, multi-stakeholder initiative? Uh, I think it could be, um, it could be a way to find um, innovative articulation between uh, different level of possible regulation. Uh, in this um, multi-stakeholder initiative, there are sometimes it's uh, it's difficult to find a real uh, MSI very um, uh, collaborative. But in some sectors, we can't or you can find a multi-stakeholder initiative we, uh, that include civil society representation of civil society a representation of local unions and representation of manager or, uh, or brand uh, sometimes. So uh, they, try to, um, they try to define some principle uh, to uh, prevent impact uh, on um, uh, employment condition of globalization and financialization. But in fact, uh, these uh, multi-stakeholder initiatives uh, don't work very well. Uh, they are not very um, collaborative. So uh, after uh, after short period, civil society leave the, the uh, multi-stakeholder initiative. So in fact, um, uh, there is a big question about uh, we uh, wish actors for regulation uh, and how is it possible to combine different actors or uh, just a country or just uh, what is possible? It's a big question, but um, because the power relations are unequal. <laughs> so if you put uh, in the same initiative uh, different uh, actors with uh, poor uh, with relation with poor relation very unequal, it's difficult to uh, to make. Uh but you talked from the point of view of the researcher, so I was like, what was your contribution to this as a researcher? Because maybe someday I want to be a researcher too, so can I actually do something? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> my, my question was that since you talked from the point of view of the researcher, I wanted to ask of your actual contribution to the corporate social responsibility uh, field. Because maybe someday I want to be a researcher, so will I be able to actually give a footprint on there? Or is this played at a, such a high level that I will never have <laughs> an impact? My point of view of CSO? Yeah, I mean, you've worked on that. You said you've worked on that as a researcher, so... Um, what was your actual contribution? Hi, my name is Christopher. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, at the beginning of, the pre uh, of your <coughs> speech, you were talking about uh, risks being transferred to employees. I was wondering what those risks are and how the what and which through mechanisms they are transferred to employees. So this is my question. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in fact, um, uh, 
the fact that legitimate the shareholder ideology is that the shareholder are legitimate uh, to uh, to be uh, to receive the value created uh, created because they assume the risk. Uh, but when um, uh, with all these uh, uh, changes in management uh, model, uh, in fact, uh, <coughs> the flexibility, uh, uh, top management demand a lot of flexibility, in fact, uh, to employees. So it's a transfer of, uh, of risks because uh, if employees assume the risk of uh, instability uh, so there is a transfer of risk uh, from top management they have to uh, assume the risk of uh, market uh, but they ask uh, to employees to be more flexible to be more yes more flexible so uh, in uh, uh, in order to uh, limit uh, the risk uh, the risk on the market, in fact. So there is a transfer also of risk that operates through uh, devices uh, that uh, increase the flexibility on employment uh, of labor market, in fact, from my point of view. Yeah? But the, the in the labor market, uh, also employees and managers they are they are both like flexible. They don't have stable jobs, if you could say. Or managers are more stable than employees. That was that was not clear for me. If managers are more stable than employees, yeah, because you said that one of the mechanisms is uh, like uh, stability. Uh, they transfer the risk of stability to to yeah. to employees. Um, the specificity of labor market in France is that in the large company we have a core, uh, a core um, of uh, employer, a skill employer, uh, who are very stable in fact. Uh, what we see uh, with this study is that the competitive pressure uh, come into the core of uh, employer uh, who have a stable relationship with uh, the firm. Uh, so, in fact, there is, uh, in the French corporation, there are always a, a, core, uh, a core employer that uh, benefit uh, from a uh, condition. And we see that uh, the transformation that we see is uh, the core uh, is limited now, and the core is not stable because competitive pressure are uh, entering in the core of stable employer in, uh, in cooperation. Thank you. Some other questions? Uh, yeah, I wanted to go back to the, qu the macro questions. Oh, looks like someone's computer's dying. I don't know if you want to grab that. But um, yeah, I, I know you said you'd worked on the micro aspects, but we're doing a lot of macro things. So that's kind of just where my, my thoughts go on this. Um, but talking about sort of the level of employment and how much that has to do with competitiveness. Um, it, it seems like looking at the, buy, the share buyback and dividends data, the numbers were massive, particularly compared to like stimulus packages in the United States and Europe. So I think they're saying about 500 billion in buybacks and 800 billion in buybacks and dividends, um, which the the entire stimulus bill in 2010 in the states was 800 billion. So, it, from my mind, if there's like a massive stimulus package sitting out there waiting that instead of going into productive investment each year is going to increase financial wealth by driving up share prices it seems like that's a massive untapped resource that should be a big policy concern of how do we try to make regulations that could tap into that so i, I mean just really simply could you just make it illegal for companies to buy their own shares like that sort of as far as talking real rough what is possible here um it, it seems like there's a lot more leeway particularly for big countries to that to be able to 
do something about this. And I was just wondering sort of what, what you think about that or what you know, because this is all fairly new to me. Um, so I don't know the legal framework very well. Uh, a legal framework uh, to, uh, to try to have an action on shareholder backback and uh, uh, <laughs> uh, yes, of course, I think uh, uh, there are a lot of um, my position is that we have to regulate uh, in a legal form uh, this, uh, uh, this point, uh, but um, I don't know really how to do, and because it's not my, my, my field, uh, in fact. Uh, I, I think you can't uh, uh, discuss of this point with Tristan Ouvray. For example, we, uh, uh, we work on this. Um, it's difficult for me to, uh, to respond because it's, it's not uh, my, uh, my speciality and it's, uh, it's very uh, difficult, it's very complex and uh, 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 I could see generality but it's not, uh, it's not uh, the place to... Sorry. <laughs> Okay. So thank you. Thank you to you. Thank you.